Welcome this morning to worship. I am standing here in the Blue Rapids United Presbyterian Church get, greeting you this morning. We're glad that you have joined us and however you come to the table, you are welcome. Let us enter into worship with surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Hear the opening words of scripture from Psalm 90, verses 14 through 17. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad as many days as you have afflicted us, and as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be manifest to your servants, and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, and prosper us for the work of our hands. O oh, prosper, 
for the work of our hands. Powerful God, you stir up your people with challenging words. Open our ears to hear truly the truth which you bring, and may it shake up our lives so that we can be your faithful witness in the world. Amen. When we confess our sins, God hears us and turns an ear towards our troubled hearts. Let us confess. Eternal God, you call us to engage in your grace in new and exciting ways, to follow you above all else. Instead, we shrink from your call. We fail to step into your grace, often instead leaning on what is familiar and known. Forgive us and lead us into what we cannot yet see, Give us identities of grace and claim us as your beloved. Empower us with courage to let go of what we know and step into a life with you. Give us anchors to hold onto when the world around us shakes and leads us with your loving support and unending forgiveness. Friends, God loves us at every moment of our lives and invites us into a life of freedom in grace. Friends, let us be as God's beloved, forgiven and freed. Before we enter the scripture, I just want to take a moment. The last few weeks have been kind of tense for our society, to put it mildly. Our children may not understand the events in our world fully, but they do understand when the adults around them are anxious and stressed. And so they can tell and they can feel your stress right now. And one of the one greatest things we can do with them is walk in our faith with them. There's an article, if you have your bulletin, that you can read that's very helpful for how to talk to our children about what's going on in this world. But a very important piece you can do right now is pray with your child. And don't just say the words for them. Let them say the words of prayer. Listen to what they say and remind them that God is listening. God hears us when we pray. We begin by introducing God's Word with Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 5a. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Amnadab, Amnadab, the father of Nishan, Nishan, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Our scripture today is from Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 through 21, chapter 6, verses 16 through 17, and verses 22 through 25. Then Joshua, son of Nun, 
sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and spent the night there. The king of Jericho was told, Some Israelites have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come only to search out the whole land. But the woman took the two men and hid them. And then she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they came from. And when it was time to close the gate at dark, the men went out. Where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly so you can overtake them. She had, however, brought them up to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax that she had laid out on the roof. So the men pursued them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords. As soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before they went to sleep, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that dread of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt in fear before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. As soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no courage left in any of us because of you. The Lord your God is indeed God in heaven above and on earth below. Now then, since I have dealt kindly with you, swear to me by the Lord that you in turn will deal kindly with my family. Give me a sign of good faith that you will spare my father and my mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. The men said to her, Our life for yours. If you do not tell this business of ours, then we will deal kindly and faithfully with you when the Lord gives us the land. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the outer side of the city wall, and she resided in the wall itself. She said to them, Go toward the hill country, so that the pursuers may not come upon you. Hide yourself there for three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward you may go on your way. The men said to her, We will be released from this oath that you have made us swear if we invade the land and you do not tie this crimson cord in the window through which you let us down, and you do not gather in your house your father and mother, your brothers, and all your family. If any of you go out the doors of your house into the street, they shall be responsible for their own death, and we shall be innocent. But if a hand is laid upon any who are with you in the house, we shall bear the responsibility for their death. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be released from this oath that you made us swear to you. She said, according to your word, so be it. She sent them away, and they departed. And then she tied a crimson cord in the window. And at the seventh time, when the priest had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab, the prostitute, and all who are with her in the house shall live because she hid the messengers we sent. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, Go into the prostitute's house and bring the woman out of it, and all who belong to her as you swore to her. So the young men who had been spies went in and brought Rahab out along with her father, her mother, her brother, and all who belonged to her. They brought all her kindred out and set them outside the camp of Israel. They burned down the city and everything in it, only the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab, the prostitute, with her family and all who belonged to her, Joshua spared. Her family has lived in Israel ever since. For she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. The word of the Lord. Amen. God's people have wandered in the desert for 40 years. Long past is the time when the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. But because of their own stubborn hearts, they end up wandering in the desert. They have wandered with only the promise of God to guide them. 
It's been long enough that a generation has passed without seeing the promised land, but not so long that the world has forgotten what has happened in Egypt, has forgotten the blood in the Nile or the plagues. Not so long that the stories of God might be forgotten, lost to a Pharaoh that did not know Joseph and Tamar and the people of God. But long enough that most people who God called out of Egypt are gone, leaving the promise in the hands of the next generation. On the death of their leader, Moses, God calls Joshua to lead the people to claim what God has promised. Joshua leads the people in a time of great conquest, winning battle after battle. And this is the story of Jericho, one such battle. Jericho is a walled fortress that sits between the people and the promised land. And it's in Jericho that we meet our woman of the week, Rahab. Perhaps you know her name. Maybe you know what she was. Maybe you know her story. Or maybe she's just a name in the list of names that you've only ever maybe glanced at. But this woman, listed in the text today, holds deep and unwavering faith. Such deep faith that as she is grafted into the line of Christ and hailed in our New Testament scriptures, not once, but over and over. Rahab is a Canaanite prostitute. Now let's tease that out a little bit, because some have made efforts to soften her identity by implying that she could be more adequately seen as a landlady. After all, they draw on her actions in the story, like providing a place for the spies to sleep and food for them to eat. But the Hebrew word sona is pretty clearly defined in scripture as prostitute, or even in more crude interpretations, whore. Rahab is not the type of character we tell our children about as they go to bed. She is not a woman in good standing, though she is most definitely a woman who can stand on her own. In our story, we find she owns a home, is independent, and our story tells us thinks for herself. As she waits and watches the Israelites come closer, she has faith. She knows that she needs to move, not for political reasons, not to save herself, but because she knows who God is. God is the God of heaven above and earth below. Rahab in her life of sin, Rahab a woman of faith, Rahab a foreigner who has only heard the stories of these people, places her faith in God. She makes meaning of her life and what is going around her through trust in God's power, not in the gods of her people. She risks her social status, her livelihood, her life to protect God's people. She knows that the Canaanite gods are absolutely no match for Yahweh. And she puts her hands in his hands. But there's more to her statement than just, my God is bigger than your God. Rahab is clearly setting God in a place of sovereignty. Notice she says, your God is the God above the heavens and on earth, below on earth. And God sees that faith placed in his hands. And God lifts her up to a place of honor in the line of Christ and in our own faith. For me, what is perhaps so interesting about this woman is how we approach her. For some efforts have been made, as I said before, to clean her up and declare her an innkeeper. There are commentaries that do this, and Sunday school lessons are much more call comfortable calling her an innkeeper. To see her as a harlot is offensive to the senses. And yet, to gloss over this is to gloss over a very important truth. As Calvin said, writes in his Institutes, in the fact that a woman who had gained a shameful livelihood by prostitution was shortly admitted into the body of the chosen people and became a member of the church, 
we are furnished with a striking display of divine grace, which could thus penetrate into a place of shame and draw forth from it not only Rahab, but her father and other members of her family. God's grace for this woman penetrates the darkest and the deepest shame. She is not the type of woman you want in the lineage of Christ, and yet God's redemption lifts her up to the place of honor. Rahab is given a place in the line of Christ and hailed in our scriptures as a woman of deep and meaningful faith. We find her in Hebrews 11.31 where it says, By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not, and when she received the spies with peace. She's listed in a long list of ancestors in that chapter who have faith. And she's the only woman outside of Sarah listed. In James 2.25, Likewise, were not Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she welcomed the messengers and set them out on another road? Her faith matters, but so does her identity as a prostitute. Because through her story, we see the full measure of God's grace and glory at work. Rahab reaches out to make, make meaning of life, and God offers her a place at the table. I think about this because Rahab isn't the type of person we would like to see at the table. Her reputation, her way of life, even if we look past her line of work, she is still a foreigner, not one of God's people. But God not only includes her at the table, he grafts her into the family. God welcomes her when many do not. We clean her up, turn her into an innkeeper, and do our best to wash over her sin. But God sees her as she is, enters her shame, and calls her beloved. This matters as we look at the world today. This matters as we run down the list of those on the inside and those on the outs. This matters because we don't get to choose who comes to the table. We only get to choose to work towards God's grace. And just what do we think grace does in our lives and in the lives of others? Christ's grace is not limited to our hope or to our understanding. Christ's grace is unlimited, and God reaches out in all times and in all ways to those we might overlook. Our faith, though, is not for the clean, the upright, the whole. Our faith specifically reaches out to the brokenness and covers us. God never said, come to me, all who have your life together, and I will help you hold what you have. God said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We are, as God's imperfect people, in need of God's perfect grace. We are in God's kingdom as Rahab, in need of God to cover our shame and help us make meaning of this world. We have a mission in the church to call people into faithful relationships, even people we'd rather leave out of the story. This is a call, and it's one that is hard and difficult and messy because we don't have it all together, and we are likely to get stuff wrong. As Dr. Letty Russell says, there is no perfect church, and our imperfect church is the only one we have as we seek to point ourselves to God's new household. God sees us as we are, broken and lost. God knows our hearts and what we carry. We are not perfect people, but we are perfectly loved. God calls us beloved. God calls us to the table. Can we make room for all who God calls?
come into prayer this morning. Prayers are found in the bulletin, and we try to do updates as they come in. If you have a prayer, be sure to send it to us. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who sees every day, event, and eon, we ask your mercy and abundant grace. We know that all earthly kingdoms are but a whisper compared to the sweep of your reign in the cosmos. Those of us who inhabit this land, we, the people of the United States, call on you in this moment of travail. Safeguard our commitment to form a more perfect unit, to protect each citizen in this hour. Grant that we will draw together in an effort to establish justice and ensure domestic tranquility. Form us together that we may promote the general welfare and live as a beloved community. God, who is good and our delight, make us agents of the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our prosperity. Emmanuel, be with us. And together we lift our voices and we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is that point in the service when we offer up our offering. The offering is collected each week by the various churches. That information is on your screen. You can also give into different ministries. Um, earlier there was an announcement about the blood bank at Frankfurt. Be sure that if you would like to give blood, that you call and make an appointment. However you come and give, give out of that amazing realization that God's grace has covered you as you are. Let us pray. As Jesus offered his whole life to you, so move our hearts to dedicate all we have to your service. Bless these tokens of our gratitude for all that we have been given in this life and our desire that we may be fed, clothed, and freed from the things which bind them by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Benediction. We go nowhere by accident. Wherever we go, God is sending us. Wherever we are, God has put us there. He has a purpose for us being there. Christ lives in us and has something he wants to do through us. We believe this and go in his grace, his love, and his power. Amen. Join me in the third verse of Amazing Grace. <laughs> 